first of all, uh, more formally, greetings on behalf of the IEEE Control System Society. I think this is working, isn't it? Uh, currently, I am serving as uh, president of the society for the rest of the year. Uh, until CDC uh, later this year at, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, a, a real honor to be here to, to speak with you. This might be the most challenging talk I've ever given just after lunch because I've pretty much violated all of Professor Ho's rules about you know, number of symbols per page and things like that. So I, please do forgive me. I'm just a sort of adopted child in, in the family, so you know. <laughs> Okay, I want to talk about performance guarantees for approximate dynamic programming schemes. Uh, ya Jing Liu is a PhD student of mine and Ali Pizeshki, a, a colleague of mine at Colorado State University. Now, I, uh, you know, in fact, it's true that there are kind, kind of symbols in here and equations and so forth, but I will try to be as descriptive as possible. So if you don't want to look at the slides and all these symbols, you know, I, I hope if you just listen to me, it'll be, it'll be good enough. Okay, so here, here's some motivation for what I'm talking about. So we're talking about optimal decision making with multiple actions, optimal control, basically. And typically, as we've heard many times this morning, uh, this is a computationally intractable uh, uh, problem to solve precisely, exactly. So the usual approach is to resort to approximations and heuristics uh, uh, and these sorts of things. Uh, by the way, Professor Ho has a fantastic paper back in the 90s talking about heuristics. Uh, actually, I think I handled that paper. I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, now, the downside with the usual downside with heuristics is that usually you don't have any performance guarantees, right? So, you know, you come up with some algorithm, you write a paper about it, you do tons of simulation and try and show that, see, it's good, right? But typically you can't prove anything. Now, however, in some cases, these decision problems have a, a special structure called submodularity. And often, the approximations or the heuristics are special cases of what are called greedy strategies uh, or greedy schemes in these submodular optimization problems. And for submodular problems, the nice thing about it is that greedy schemes have provable bounds, provable performance guarantees. Typically, you, you get a result like that. The greedy scheme is at least 1 minus e to the minus 1, which is just 0.63, 63%, as good as optimal. In terms of the ratio of the objective function resulting from your greedy scheme, compared uh, over the objective function that's optimal. Oh, we're talking about maximization here, okay? All right, so I'm, here's the outline. I'm gonna give you some background on submodularity. What is that? Now, I know some, many of you probably know what it is. Uh, maybe you've read uh, Professor Yao's book from the, from the early 90s. Fantastic book, very difficult, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> uh, and then I'll talk about uh, 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 the, the, how that framework applies basically to dynamic program, pro, uh, and in particular approximate dynamic program. Now, I, I promise I give only the simplest version of results, enough to convey basic idea. No proofs, but there's still <laughs> going to be these symbols and equations. So please do forgive me. All right, very simple stuff, okay? Uh, I, I just want to uh, sort of construct an analogy for you so that you can think of submodularity in terms of concavity, okay, or convex optimization. So if I have a function from real numbers to real numbers, f, say without loss of generality, the function at zero is zero. Now when you say the function is monotone, you mean that for all x less than or equal to y, f of x less than f of y, so that's a monotone function. And, and then you can have a, another property, which is a second order property called diminishing return, which means to say that for all x less than or equal to y, for all increments, z, positive increments, the increment the objective function value is bigger at x than at y just because x is less than or equal to y. So in other words, the function looks like this, which of course is a very common looking function in you know, economics and you know, whatnot, right? Utility, concave. When you have a concave thing like that, as you know, optimization, you know, a lot of things about optimization becomes easy, right? So the analog to this thing, the discrete world, is basically submodularity, okay? 
So let, let's take a look at that. So we want to go beyond the real line to a more general setting, in particular a discrete setting. Specifically, we want to consider objective functions with multiple decision actions as arguments. Now, in this setting, you can think of two different ways of talking about uh, these actions as decision variables, right? First, you, you can think of a function whose uh, argument is just a set of actions. So I give you a set of actions, I, I, you know, I, I tell you, you give me a set of actions, I tell you the value associated with the set of actions. But you can also think of ordered sets or strings of actions. So you give me an ordered set of actions, I tell you the value of it. Now here we want to consider only strings, even though a lot of this theory applies also to the non-ordered case. Uh, and we typically consider discrete actions because in the continuous case, as I say, we have convex optimization theory, which is, is rich, right? Duality and so forth. Okay, so ah, so here's the, <laughs> the tough part. But it's really written in a way to be analog to the one I showed you before, okay? So I have a set of possible actions, X, so not real, but X. So a string of actions is just an ordered set of actions, right? A1 through AK, where each of these elements is in X. The length of a string is just bar. Uh, let's say it's k, uh, in this case, right, k actions. Now, all possible strings, let's call it x star. So x star is a set of all possible strings of any arbitrary length, including length 0, which means the null string, OK, the empty string. And I'm going to use this symbol for the empty string. That, so this is the analog to this is 0 on the real line, OK? Uh, now, we want to be able to talk about how you, you know, add, so to speak, two strings together. And one way to think about addition of strings is concatenation. So I give you two strings, and you just put one after the other, okay? So M plus or O plus, this in LaTeX, this is backslash O plus. Uh, it's just one string followed by another. Now, we need a partial order on strings so I can talk about mono, you know, monotone and things like that. So here, here's one partial order, m less than equal to n, if n is just m o plus something. In other words, m, which is less than equal to n, is a prefix of n, OK? So that's one way to get partial ordering in strings. OK, so I hope that <laughs> this is simple enough, even though it's got a lot of symbols. Good, wakey, wakey. OK, good, everyone's awake. All right. So suppose I have a function from strings to real numbers, or right, f of x star to r, without loss of generality, f at the empty string is 0. What does monotone mean? Well, let's use prefix as our partial order. So monotone just means monotone, just like we had before, right? If m is less than equal to n, f of m less than equal to f of n. That's monotone. Diminishing return means what? For all m less than equal to n, and for all actions, if I concatenate that action to m, I get an increment in the function that is bigger than doing the same thing at n just because m is less than or equal to n. So if you had to picture a function like this, it's just, just like what I drew before. Of course, obviously, that's just an abstraction, right? You have to just think about it that way, but it's not really like that. Now, uh, if these conditions hold, let's call f String submodular. Now, I mean, the, the reason I put the word string here is that this. usually when people say submodular, they mean with respect to just sets as arguments. But since we're talking about strings, we'll, we'll use the word string submodular. I mean, you know, in the literature, people use different, you know, terminology for these things. But for this talk, I think it's simple enough if we just use string submodular. Now, notice that uh, the notion of monotone with respect to prefix is just one way to do it, right? You can also do postfix monotone. So if, if m concatenated with something else has a function value that's bigger than just f at that something else, well, this is kind of monotone with respect to postfix partial order, right? So you can have prefix monotone, postfix. Now, obviously, you can have other things too, right? You can take two strings and interleave them and all kinds of things like that. But let's just do these two for now, actually, in this whole talk. Won't be any more general than that. All right, so what? Well, suppose I have this optimization problem, okay? Maximize f of m subject to m in x star and the length less than or equal to capital K. So it's just some optimization problem. Now, uh, this constraint set here, m, m less than or equal to K, it's actually called 
a uniform string matrix of rank k. Why is it so fancy? Why is this name so fancy for such a simple thing? Uh, simply because, in fact, you can, the same sort of results hold if you generalize this constraint set to what are called general string matrices as well. Uh, but for now, just this is all I'm going to do. Okay? So so far so good. It's a very simple problem, right? Ob objective function like that and constraint. Well, what can you say about this problem? Well, first of all, let's talk about what an optimal solution is and what a greedy solution is. An optimal solution is just a solution to that problem. Okay? So if f is prefix monotone, then there exists one optimal string with length k, right? Because you can always extend it, and if it's monotone, it just gets no smaller. And let's call that O sub k, or O for optimal. So that's an optimal string. What's a greedy string? A greedy string is a string generated by this algorithm. So a, a, a string is called greedy if it has this property, this recursive property. And this property is very simple. It says this algorithm starts with the empty string. And then for the first element, you pick the element resulting in the largest objective function value. You put it in. That's the first element. For the second element, you pick the, object, the, the, the element with the largest objective function that you get by adding the second element. And then you just do this until you get to k. Okay? That, that's a greedy algorithm, isn't it? Now, this odd max here denotes a set of actions that maximizes this function. And uh, you know, the reason it's, it's uh, element off is because it could be non-unique, right? So it's just a set of all such things. OK, so that's the optimal string. That's, that's a string generated by the greedy algorithm. What can you say about this? And this is sort of the, the, the main celebrated result. Originally uh, proved by Streeter and Golovin in 2008. And uh, they show that the, the following. If f is string submodular and postfix monotone, so it's got both prefix monotone and postfix monotone, then any greedy string satisfies this property. The ratio of the objective function value for the greedy solution divided by the optimal solutions, at least this number, and this number you can see is a number that uh, depends on k, capital K, the length of the string. And as k gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it, it, it grows and approaches, sorry, it doesn't grow. Yeah, it, go, it goes down. And, 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 and approaches 1 minus e to the minus 1, right? As k goes to infinity. But of course, for a finite value of k, is actually a bigger number than this. The bound is better. So th this is a bound for the greedy algorithm. OK, so far, so good, right? Simple, simple thing. All right. Well, what can we do with this? Well, a few more little notes about this. The result requires f to be postfix monotone in addition to being submodular, string submodular. And remember, postfix monotone just means this. But you can, in fact, weaken that condition. You don't need postfix monotoneity. You can do this, this kind of thing, which is actually harder to check <laughs> than, than just plain old postfix monotone. And for an even weaker condition, you can look at a, OK, so, but basically, the, the, the basic result is what I just showed you, OK? The, the little embellishments you can do to it. Yes, <laughs> yes, Lisa. I'm sorry. If I don't put someone's name, it means it's me. <laughs> uh, me and my group, I guess. All right. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering what curvature is, curvature is a quantification of uh, diminishing returns. And if you can quantify it, uh, it's sort of like knowing the second derivative of the function, then you can get an even better bound that's, that depends on the curvature. It'll be better than 1 minus e to the minus 1. All right. So far, so good. OK. Now, of course, bounds for the greedy strategy have many obvious applications. You know, I walk around, in, especially in OR conferences, and virtually you know, most of the talks given are on, hey, look, I have a new algorithm for this. I have a new algorithm for that. And it, almost all of them are at least recognizable to someone like me as a greedy strategy with respect to some function. You know, that, that's not so surprising, right? So you can try and use these bounds for algorithms like that, even though it's not common to do. Now, the main goal here for me is I want to apply the, this kind of bounding method to optimal control and, in particular, approximate dynamic programming. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. All right. 
So now recall that the problem is to maximize a function with respect to a string of actions over a finite horizon. The usual approach is dynamic programming, right? Uh, via Bellman's principle. Now, of course, uh, we, as you know from Professor Tsao's talk this morning, uh, this is computationally a uh, very complicated thing to do. In fact, in particular, approximate, the, the straight dynamic programming has a complexity that grows exponentially. So for the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, people have been looking at approximate dynamic programming schemes. The problem with these things is you can implement them, you know, like using deep learning or whatnot, right? Uh, but you can't prove anything about it. Performance guarantees remain elusive. Now, one example ADP that I think that, you know, people who are familiar with Professor Ho's uh, line of work would find appealing is, is a scheme called rollout. Because rollout is a scheme that simply involves uh, essentially simulation optimization at each step of doing approximate dynamic programming. You have to, you have to compute the argmax of the expected value of something. <laughs> And typical way of doing it is by simulation, and that's what rollout is. Okay, it's an ex example of an approximate dynamic programming scheme. There are other examples, of course. So you can ask these questions, right? So you give me an approximate dynamic programming scheme. How good is this ADP scheme relative to the optimal strategy in terms of the objective function? Sometimes ADP is not much better than just what is called the myopic scheme, and I'll tell you exactly what that is. Why is that? Sometimes. If you take, so rollout involves what is called a base policy. If you roll out a base policy, sometimes it's not much better than the base policy itself. What's going on? Can we answer questions like these? Uh, I should uh, point out for those of you who read textbooks that uh, one of the most popular optimization textbooks is by uh, Dmitry Bertsek. You thought I was going to say my book, right? No, no, I, it's Dmitry Bertsekas. And, and Bertsekas, of course, is one of the people uh, credited with the p development and popularization of approximate dynamic programming. You know, Bertsekas and John C. C. Cleese. Uh, but despite these two giants in the field, still performance guarantees remain elusive. All right. Now, if you give me an optimal control problem, yeah, and of course you can write that down in the way I wrote it, right? And that function turns out to be submodular, then the greedy scheme for that problem, which is called the myopic scheme, has provably bounded performance relative to optimal, right? You just straight away apply it. But here's the main idea. Even if the optimal control problem is not submodular, you might still be able to use our results to bound the performance of ADP. How do you do that? Well, let's first take a look at the the, uh, the formulation of optimal control and see what we can do with it, okay? So here, here's about the most general formulation of optimal control I think you can write down, pretty much, you know, it's a... Uh, well, maybe yeah. I'm missing one point. Yeah. In dynamic control, typically it is not like you can take any action and append it to concat concatenate yes. to, to a string. Yes. It may in incur infeasibility. Okay, it yes. May, it may not be feasible. So right. Uh, matroid. <laughs> uh, matroid oh, so constraints. You, you still need the matroid structure. Yes. You still need the matroid structure. Okay. So in, in addition to everything else, you need a matroid structure. Yes. I but but the, the unconstrained version is a special kind of matroid, right? The so-called uniform matroid. It's sort of, you know, the un, unconstrained version of a matroid. It does satisfy all the matroid requirements, but if, if, you, if you have a smaller set of feasible strings, you need the matroid structure for this to work. Right. OK, now, uh, so here's just, you know, maximize the cost function or the cumulative uh, state dependent cost function as a function of actions subject to general nonlinear dynamics. This is the, the deterministic version, OK? Uh, so you have a set of states, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think this is fairly uh, familiar to all of you. Yes? All right, so here's my optimal control problem. Now, suppose I define a function v sub k, which is a function of state and string, as follows. It's just the, essentially the value to go with respect to the string, OK? The, the objective function that remains from k to the end of the horizon if you apply this string of actions starting at xk. So, 
That's VK. So you can rewrite the optimal control problem this way, right? Maximize V1, start at X1, and the whole string is here subject to this constraint. Now, the optimal solution, let's call that O sub K. And of course, you need an optimal state sequence associated with that optimal string. Let's call that, let's put stars for that sequence. All right, now Bellman's principle, if you have to write Bellman's principle using my notation, this is it, this is Bellman's principle. Uh, the optimal action at time k is in the arg max of this thing. One step reward plus reward to go, okay? But of course the reward to go involves the optimal, optimal string for the remaining of the horizon and optimal state sequence. All right, now dynamic programming uses this kind of thing to iterate backwards over time, keeping the states as variables and working all the way back to k equals to one, as described by uh, uh, Sheeran's talk this morning. Now, of course, you can't actually do this in many practical problems because merely storing the iterates, these things, requires an exponential amount of memory. So even if you could do it, you, it's an extremely expensive thing to do. Okay, so here's a myopic solution. Myopic solution just sort of says, you know what? Let's forget the value to go. <laughs> Let's just choose an action based on the one step reward at each time. So now if I define the function little f as just a cumulative reward associated with any string, then the myopic solution is a greedy scheme with respect to this f, isn't it? Therefore, if this f is string submodular, the previous bounds hold. But the problem is that in general, string submodularity will fail for this f. This f is not likely to satisfy submodularity. Why? Because the whole point of optimal control is delayed gratification, uh, which is counter to submodularity, right? I mean, the whole point of doing optimal control is sometimes you have to make a decision now that is not good for you right now, but it's in as a net result better for you later. True? If you don't have delayed gratification, then you don't really have an optimal control problem, right? I, I, I hope uh, Professor Ho agrees with that. <laughs> if, if I had to give like one heuristic statement about optimal control, it would be delayed gratification. Oh, I, by the way, I learned that from Professor Ho, the idea of simplifying things into one sentence. <laughs> All right. What is approximate dynamic programming? Very simple. It's just the algorithm that does the following. It starts at time one, but at each time you add to the myopic, you know, this one step reward, some other function that's a function of state and action that is supposed to mimic the value to go. Approximates the value to go, if indeed you know how to approximate. That's, that's what I call approximate dynamic programming. If you have a way of approximating that thing, Let's call that ADP. It's a big family of algorithms, right? One special case is when this approximation is identically zero, in which case it's just a myopic scheme. But you can slap other things there, right? Now, the value to go approximation can be based on a number of methods. For example, if you make it zero, that's just myopic. If you use as an approximate value to go just the cumulative reward associated with a particular policy called the base policy. This is called rollout. Um, first described by uh, Bertsekas. Actually, he kind of borrowed it from some AI people. Tesoro was really one of the first people to do this. And you know, I actually have a JDETS sort of tutorial paper with a few, many examples of this kind of, of problem. Now, in the stochastic setting, the, the way you would compute this, this guy is by simulation, right? You'd compute this by simulation. So when you want to do the arg max, it's just simulation optimization, right? Many experts on that here, much uh, know a lot more of that than myself. AlphaGo probably is the, is the biggest uh, recent uh, popular approximate dynamic programming scheme to make media. You know, it plays Go. And it uses essentially a neural network to approximate that W term. Uh, but how can you bound the performance of an ADP scheme? And here we go. Okay, so I'm going to tell you exactly how you do this in the next five minutes. 
the key idea is to define a string optimization problem of the kind I showed you earlier, for which the greedy strategy is the ADP scheme. And I think, once I tell you this, I think you can guess what that is now, how you do that, because it's rather simple. How do you do that? Well, you do this. Suppose A sub little k is a set of all strings not exceeding k. Define the function f on A sub capital K. This is the uniform matroid. Uh, you know, in general, you put the matroid thing in there, right? Uh, this, that's just the cumulative reward plus approximate value to go, okay? Now, of course, for strings of length capital K, if this little k is capital K, this guy is just equal to the cumulative reward because I'm going to define the approximate value to go to be zero at the terminal state, at the, the terminal horizon. So this is just the original objective function value of, the, of that general problem. Hence, the string optimization problem above is equivalent to the optimal control problem I showed you earlier. So that's the first thing, right? This problem with this f has, is equivalent in the sense that any solution to this is a solution to the other at, at, at capital K, first point. Second point. Suppose I give you uh, this substring, right? And I, I, I want to, I, I look at this, this is the greedy algorithm, right? I plug this F that I showed you earlier, and all we get is Bellman's principle, or, or rather what looks like Bellman's principle, correct? But th this is what is called the ADP scheme, isn't it? So this is simply the ADP scheme I showed you earlier. So number one, for this F, it's equivalent. Number two, the greedy scheme for this F is the ADP scheme. So this means that the ADP scheme that I, I, I showed you earlier is just the greedy strategy for this, this, this problem. And hence, if I now apply the previous result, uh, I can try and do something with it to get uh, a bound. Right? So here's an example of, of a bound. Not the prettiest looking example, but I think you can imagine. It's basically a set of conditions. Don't read this. It's just some number. It's just a set of conditions that guarantee submodularity. So if F satisfies these conditions, then the ADP scheme satisfies this bound just by applying uh, the result I just showed you plus the, the Streeter and Golovin kind of thing. Well, this I think is the first time we can actually prove or guarantee the performance of ADP if indeed you can satisfy these, these conditions. Now, I mean, these two conditions are very kind of intuitively obvious. The first is that your, your you know, uh, value to go is not too different from the true value to go. And the second is just some monotone uh, condition with respect to the greedy substring. Now, you can show that this monotone condition holds in general for large classes of approximate dynamic programming. For example, rollout, no matter what base policy you have, always satisfies condition number two. All right. Now, uh, I'll tell you some other ongoing work that, that I have here, and then I'll end, okay? So we're trying to get, of course, easily checkable conditions under which specific ADP schemes satisfies the bound. For example, for rollout, we have a paper a few couple of years ago. Uh, we want to design ADP schemes based on these conditions. In fact, yeah, I, I submit, I'm, I'm going to propose that this may be a maybe a framework that, that provides a definition for what is a good ADP scheme. What's a good ADP scheme? And a good ADP scheme is a scheme for which the F I showed you is submodular. Uh, canonical examples that satisfy these conditions. Now you can get tighter bounds based on curvature. You can, like I said, uh, do more general constraint sets, right, based on matroids. But of course the bound gets a little looser if you have constraints. And uh, you know, my real interest is in applying this to stochastic optimal control problems, right? MDP and POM DPs. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Hope I didn't go over too much. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> so, so your performance guarantee is a lower bound. Do you have any, any idea, like usually, uh, how far away would that be? Ah, how yeah. Conservative is that 
Yeah, I mean, it is a worst case bond, so it is conservative. It is quite conservative. Uh, if you have curvature, you know, you can immediately get, uh, uh, raise the bound. And sometimes with curvature, the bound can be quite high, like 0.9 or something like that, much higher than 63%. But curvature is difficult to, to compute. Uh, you know, it's, it's like computing second derivative. I, I think Crystal's computed curvature for a problem, didn't you? Sixty-three percent. Sixty-three. Yeah, okay. but but worst case, right? Yeah, but it's it's not it's not a great bound. Well, it's pretty darn good for in general, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, what I'm trying to say is that with with curvature, you can calculate this large problem. We were able to get within five percent, ninety-five percent. But computing the curvature can be hard. But on the other hand, do you know if you throw in more, you can get it sort of uh, equal to one or even close to one? Yes, yes. In some cases, yes, but those are the cases when greedy is optimal, right? Okay. I, I think you, you, didn't you write some papers on that in the 90s? I, I seem I, to recall. I forgot, but it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's you, had, you had some stuff with greedy always. Yeah, greedy is always optimal. Greedy is always, uh, yeah. It's so in, yeah, with special structure, you, greedy can be always optimal. Yeah. Right. Greedy is, is good enough. It's really a good enough result. Right. You know, you, you say 63 percent is not that good. These guys, the computer scientists who use results like that, say that it's not worth being optimal if you can prove this. It's like forget about being optimal because this is doable. Optimal is not doable. No, but I mean, okay. Then I will go back to what you were saying earlier. I, I come up with an algorithm. I show you lots of simulation results and heuristics. Mm -hmm. Yes. I cannot prove it, but you know, I think most practitioners would get that. Sure. I guess it's, a, it's a point of view. I, I would yeah. not consider 63 percent as a great bound. <laughs> yeah. I think I, barely over 50 percent. <laughs> okay, let's stop here. Okay. You're fine. Maybe the bound will push you to 61 percent. So yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Usually, yeah, you can. You, you, you can. Yes. That yes. Sorry. Okay.